a high-stakes summit in Moscow. Leaders of China and Russia support each other's stance on Ukraine while agreeing to solidify their unity against the U.S. Under the U.S. Chips Act, in exchange for U.S. subsidies, chip makers are to limit production in countries of concern, but upgrading technologies is allowed. What does it mean for South Korean chip makers? South Korea's natural population continues to fall as it records a new low for January for the number of births. Good afternoon. We start with the high-stakes meeting in Moscow. Chinese President Xi Jinping and Russian President Vladimir Putin agreed to promote, quote, peace in Ukraine as Putin shows support for China's recent peace plan that was essentially rejected by the West. The two leaders also agreed to solidify unity against the U.S. Our easing just starts us off. After holding informal talks for over four hours on Monday, Chinese President Xi Jinping and Russian President Vladimir Putin held talks again on Tuesday, this time with their full delegations. And after their meeting on Tuesday, the two leaders signed and released a joint statement at the Kremlin in Moscow, where they called on the need to settle the Ukraine crisis through peace talks. Titled The Joint Statement of the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation on Deepening the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership of Coordination for the New Era, both Xi and Putin stressed that the purposes and principles of the UN Charter must be observed and international law must be followed regarding the Ukraine conflict. Putin praised the Chinese leader's push to bring peace between Ukraine and Russia. However, he accused Kyiv and its Western allies of rejecting it. Xi, meanwhile, barely mentioned the ongoing war in Ukraine. Instead, apparently tried to remain firm on China's neutral stance. However, some American pundits say China's neutral stance needs to be questioned as Xi's visit to Russia highlights its determination to push back against the U.S. and its Western allies. Meanwhile, President Xi invited President Putin to visit China this year in what some believe is a symbolic show of support after the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for Putin. Xi extended the invitation during Tuesday's meeting, inviting Putin to the third Belt and Road Forum for International Cooperation, along with Russian Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin. Putin attended the Belt and Road Forum on two previous occasions in 2017 and 2019. Meanwhile, NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg on Tuesday warned China against providing armed support to Russia. He said that the joint statement issued by the two leaders show that China and Russia are coming closer and that any weapon support from China would mean its support for an illegal war. As a first, uh, we haven't seen any proof that uh, China is uh, delivering lethal uh, weapons to Russia. Uh, but we have uh, seen uh, some signs that uh, this has been a request uh, from Russia and that this is an issue that uh, is, cons is, is uh, considered uh, 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 in Beijing. He added that if China is serious about bringing peace, it also needs to understand Ukraine's stance and communicate directly with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. Lee seung Arirang News. And with Chinese President Xi Jinping visiting Russia, another strategic foreign visit took place on the other side of the Ukraine conflict. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida made a surprise visit to Kyiv on Tuesday for talks with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. The PM pledged to deliver $470 million worth of new aid for the energy sector and some $30 million through NATO funds for non-lethal equipment. Also, with Japan set to host a G7 summit in May, the PM invited Zelensky, to which the Ukrainian leader replied he would take part virtually. The visit by Kishida, the last G7 leader to visit Ukraine, comes amid growing domestic pressure to make the trip. He becomes Japan's first post-war leader to enter a war zone since World War II. More leaders are out on the U.S. chip set that will largely affect South Korean chip makers doing business in America and China. Overall, the worst seems to have been avoided as the egg will restrict companies receiving U.S. subsidies from expanding production in other countries, but will allow them to upgrade technologies. Our Kim Doyan has more. 
Semiconductor producers that receive U.S. subsidies will not be able to expand production of advanced chips in countries of concern by more than 5% over the next 10 years. This applies to South Korean companies such as Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix, who have production lines in China. Other countries of concern include Iran, Russia, and North Korea. On Tuesday local time, the U.S. Commerce Department released a notice of proposed rulemaking and through a statement, U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo said, The innovation and technology funded in the CHIPS Act is how we plan to expand the technological and national security advantages of America and our allies. These guardrails will help ensure we stay ahead of adversaries for decades to come. The Commerce Department says the limits on expansion is, quote, meant to allow for funding recipients that have existing facilities in a foreign country of concern to continue to operate and maintain their competitiveness by allowing for technological upgrades as long as the cap is met. The rule also limits recipients of incentive funds from engaging in joint research or technology licensing efforts with a foreign entity of concern and prohibits recipients of CHIPS incentives from using the funds in other countries. The proposed regulations allow the U.S. government to claw back the entire funding awarded to any recipient that breaks the act's rules. South Korean companies had been anxiously waiting on the details of the restrictions as Samsung and SK both announced investment into the U.S. aiming for this subsidy, which could offer each company up to 53 billion U.S. dollars through subsidies and tax cuts. However, the announcement was not as strict as expected and Samsung and SK will be able to receive the subsidy while continuing production in China. With the new announcement, local reports quoted company officials from Samsung saying the company has avoided the worst. Currently, Samsung produces some 40% of its NAND flash chips and SK Hynix manufacturing about half of its global DRAM chips in China. Kim Do-yeon, Arirang News. South Korea's top companies saw their operating profits fall by nearly 70 percent during the fourth quarter of last year. According to business tracking website CEO score on Wednesday, the combined operating profits of 262 out of the top 500 Korean companies fell by 69 percent on year, despite sales going up by 11 percent. IT and electronics companies saw the most notable decline of around 85 percent. The drop is largely attributed to tech giants like Samsung Electronics and SK Hynix taking a major hit due to the sluggish chip exports. On the other hand, the automobile industry saw a jump in operating profits. Back here at home, after 18 months of investigation, South Korea's prosecution has indicted the main opposition Democratic Party's chairman, Lee Jae-myung, on allegations of corruption. Lee is mainly being accused of having used his former position as mayor of Seongnam City to grant favors to property developers so that they could pocket some 610 million U.S. dollars in illegal proceeds for the Daejeongdong redevelopment project. Prosecutors say that led to city government to suffer some $380 million of financial damage. It's also been linked to a third-party bribery case involving Seongnam Football Club in the mid-2010s. He has denied all allegations and accused the government of orchestrating the probes. This comes a few weeks after the National Assembly narrowly rejected a motion seeking parliamentary consent for his arrest. South Korea's natural population continues to fall as the first month of this year, so the lowest number of births for the month of January. Our Moon Nerian has the details. South Korea this year saw the lowest number of births and the highest number of deaths for the month of January since data was first compiled in the early 1980s. Data released by Statistics Korea on Wednesday show the number of births dropped from over 24,000 in January 2022 to just over 23,000 this year, a 6% decrease on year. Meanwhile, the number of deaths rose by 9.6% on year. 
With over 32,000 deaths recorded in January, the natural change, calculated by subtracting the number of deaths from the number of births, came to a decline in the population of some 9,000. However, the figures were more optimistic when compared with December last year. The number of births rose nearly 38% on month, and the number of deaths fell by nearly 2%. The birth rate in the past few years has generally been a bit higher in the first half of the year than in the second half. With the easing of COVID-19 restrictions last year, the number of registered marriages rose for four months in a row in the second half of last year. This streak ended with a drop in the number of marriages on month in January, falling from nearly 20,000 to 17,926. But compared to January 2022, the number of marriages went up by 21.5% on year. The number of births hit an all-time low last year, falling below the 250,000 mark, but this increase in the number of marriages is expected to have a positive impact on birth rates ahead. Moon Haryan, Arirang News. The UN administration unveils its first roadmap to achieve carbon neutrality. Total greenhouse gas emissions are to be reduced by 40 percent until 2030, something unchanged from the existing plan. But the reduction target for the industrial sector is to be lowered while using more nuclear power and renewable energy. Our Isujin has more. The Yoon so yeol administration has unveiled its first roadmap to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The Presidential Commission on Carbon Neutrality and Green Growth and the Ministry of Environment announced on Tuesday that the industrial sector is required to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 11.4 percent compared to 2018 levels by 2030, which is lower than the 14.5 percent set by the previous administration. We have taken into consideration the hardships that the industrial sector is experiencing due to limited raw material supplies and delays in technology development, as well as export competitiveness. The government, however, is maintaining the mid- to long-term goal of reducing emissions by 40 percent from 2018 levels by 2030. That's around 437 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. The target to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the energy transition sector has been revised upward to 45.9 percent from the 2018 levels from the previous 44.4 percent. The government will reduce emissions through a mix of nuclear power plants and sources of renewable energy. The nation aims to raise the proportion of nuclear energy to 32.4 percent by 2030, up from around 27 percent in 2021, and renewable energy to more than 21 percent by 2030, from 7.5 percent in 2021. There will also be a greater focus on shifting to clean energy such as solar and hydrogen. The government is planning to provide financial backing totaling 89 trillion won, or around 68.6 billion U.S. dollars, until 2027 to reach the set targets. This includes investment in the development of core carbon-neutral technologies, electric and hydrogen vehicle subsidiaries, and greenhouse gas reduction projects. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. The cost of water in South Korea is rising by the biggest increases in 17 years. According to Statistics Korea, the water price index in February rose 4.6 percent from a year earlier. That is the largest on-year increase seen since January 2006. This comes as local governments raise water bills, citing elevated production costs. The cost of drinking water also rose more than 7 percent compared to January, the biggest increase in 11 years. Now, amid soaring prices, eating out is now all the more burdensome for students and office workers. But new trends like 1,001 breakfast and smaller food portions are among the newest money-saving options. Our e on tells more. It's only 7.40 in the morning, but students are lining up in front of this cafeteria. They are here for a so-called 1,001 breakfast. Starting last week, one university in Seoul is offering students low-priced meals in the morning at a cost of around 77 cents. 
the same meal used to cost 4,001 or just a little over three U.S. dollars. Only 130 meals are prepared per day and given out on a first-come, first-served basis. I used to skip breakfast, but now I've started to have it again because it's cheap. I think this is great and hope it goes on longer so that many students can enjoy it. One official from the student office says it's planning to expand the project as the meal line is getting longer every day. We found that many students skip breakfast because of the burden of high prices. That's when we decided to participate in the 1001 breakfast project with financial support from the government. According to Statistics Korea, prices for dining out last year hit their highest in 30 years. The younger generation, especially those who live alone, have had to deal with worrying inflation over the past year. Products in smaller sizes and with lower prices are helping them to lessen the burden. For people who live alone and want a smaller proportion for a lower price, here's also a half serving of tteokbokki. Not only at an affordable price, but people say it could also reduce food waste. It was hard for me to finish up all the food by myself, so for me, I would love to have half serving tteokbokki at an affordable price of 3,000 won. Amid the soaring prices for dining out, these trends are expected to expand further as more young people are making greater efforts to tighten their purse strings. Lee Dae-hyun, Arirang News. Google has released its new AI chatbot Bard to rival similar systems from OpenAI and Microsoft. Announcing the news on its official blog on Tuesday, the tech giant said users in the U.S. and U.K. can sign up to try its own contribution to the worldwide chat GPT phenomenon. According to Google, Bard can be used in a number of ways, such as for giving tips on how to read more books this year or even explaining quantum physics in simple terms. Google said it is planning to expand across more countries and languages, but didn't specify a timeline. The release of BARD comes as San Francisco startup OpenAI's ChatGPT has completely swept public attention for months. OpenAI released its upgraded GPT-4 last week. On the back of K-culture enjoying much love globally, the culture ministry has published a book introducing traditional Korean liquor, including Kamongro. Our Shin Sebyeok takes us on a journey to discover this unique beverage. Sweet red dough. That's what this Korean traditional liquor Kamongro literally means. This liquor, with its deep, gentle aroma, was considered one of the three best liquors of the Joseon dynasty. Amid increased global popularity of Korean culture, the culture ministry has published a book that introduces various traditional alcoholic beverages, and Kamungno was one of them. Although it may not be as popular as other drinks such as makgeolli, Kamungno has long been considered a medicinal liquor that warms the body. Today, Kamungno is brewed in Paju, Gyeonggi-do province by Korea's Grand Master No. 43 Lee Gi-suk. He is the only person in Korea who can make the liquor using the traditional recipe that's been passed down through generations of her family. Making kamongno is all about waiting and patience. First, she mixes rice, millet, and the Korean fermentation's daughter, duduk, and lets the mixture sit and ripen for 15 days. Even the slightest change in temperature at this step can make a huge difference in taste later on. For the next four months, she distills it twice to get this crystal clear, 40% strength fine soju. However, it is only halfway there. She then adds seven medicinal herbs, including ginger and cinnamon, before letting it sit for three more months. After that, she removes the solids from the liquid and lets the drink rest for one more year. And here marks the end of the one-and-a-half-year journey of this red-colored dew that satisfies the senses of sight, smell, and taste. He says her goal is to continue to pass down the family legacy, keeping Korea's traditional drinks culture alive for future generations. Kamongno began as a part of my father's and my grandmother's everyday life. Now it has become a part of Korean culture over time. I want to pass down not only the recipe, but also the spirit to our future generations. She also says with Korean traditional alcoholic drinks becoming a candidate representing South Korea as its next culture ambassador, 
Kamongno could warm people's hearts. Kamongno is a liquor of warmth. I hope that it can serve as a symbol of Korean warmth and hospitality. In that way, I believe this could potentially contribute to the spread of Korean culture. Shin Sebyeok, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. In Haiti, the United Nations has reported on the devastating impact of gang violence in the country. According to a UN report on Tuesday, at least 530 people have died this year alone in Haiti as a result of increasing gang-related violence. This is on top of 277 recorded kidnappings and 300 people left injured in attacks, which have mostly taken place in the capital, Port-au-Prince. The UN says the majority of casualties were killed or injured in sniper-like, seemingly indiscriminate shootings. In a bid to mitigate the situation, the UN has called for foreign intervention in the form of a specialized support force. And with US President Joe Biden set to address the issue while meeting the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in Ottawa on Thursday, the UN will be hoping that Biden can convince Trudeau to send a security intervention team to stabilize the Caribbean country. Turning over to Uganda now, where Parliament passed a new law on Tuesday that brings back the death penalty and life sentences for homosexuality. Called the Anti-Homosexuality Bill, the law would give the death penalty for so-called aggravated homosexuality and life in prison if caught having gay sex. It marks an even stricter crackdown on the LGBTQ community in a country that has already banned homosexuality. The new law also introduces a 10-year prison sentence for merely identifying as LGBTQ or engaging in same-sex related activities. Such activities include promoting and abetting homosexuality. Supporters of the law say it's necessary to preserve traditional values. But human rights activists say that it violates multiple fundamental rights. Meanwhile, a major review into London's Metropolitan Police has accused it of being institutionally racist, sexist and homophobic. This is according to a 363-page report released on Tuesday, which followed a year-long review. The report alleges that the Met failed to protect both members of the public and female staff. It included stories of sexual assaults, many of which were covered up, and instances where evidence from rape cases was not properly stored. The report comes as public trust in Britain's biggest force has collapsed in the wake of a number of scandals, including a case where a police officer raped and murdered a woman. The report also included instances of racism and bullying among Met Police officers. And finally, thousands of people gathered in Mexico's Teotihuacan ruins on Monday local time to welcome the spring equinox, also known as the first day of the solar new year. Dressed in white, pilgrims from both Mexico and abroad climbed Teotihuacan's Pyramid of the Sun and welcomed the first light of the solar new year. It's believed by many that doing so imbues them with energy from the pyramid and the equinox sun. The 2,000-year-old Pyramid of the Sun serves as a gathering space for meteorological events and is the world's third largest pyramid. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good afternoon. Those of us in central parts of the country are having late May-like warmth going up to 12 degrees higher than season norms today with some record-breaking temp temperatures this afternoon. But unfortunately, the ultra-fine dust level will stay high in the capital region in Chungcheong Namdo province. So please have a face mask that can filter dust today. Mostly sunny skies are turning cloudy with rain in the forecast. But Jeju has been seeing rain since this morning, which will spread to southern provinces late this afternoon before expanding to the capital region tonight. This round of rain, which will continue into tomorrow afternoon, will help to ease the dryness in the air. In Seoul and Chungcheon are seeing highs nearing 20.
5 degrees this afternoon. The temperatures return to normal at the end of the week, with rain to continue on Jeju through Saturday. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of the day.